The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner won her 2016 campaign with a promise to drastically reform the justice system in the city. As she seeks a second term four years later against the backdrop of anti-racism protests, Gardner points to a record low population at the workhouse and expanded diversion programs as markers of success. But she remains dogged by questions about rising crime and her ability to manage the office. The Democratic incumbent joins me next on the latest episode of Politically Speaking. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Rachel Littman. Joining me this morning are my co-hosts today. Jason Rosenbaum. And the incumbent circuit attorney. Hello, good morning. Kim Gardner. Uh, welcome, the circuit attorney. This is one of the two politically speakings we will be doing with the candidates for circuit attorney, both the incumbent and her challenger, Mary Pat Carl. And as we have been doing pretty consistently now for about four months, we are doing this via Zoom. So while Jason has ventured into the office and is in the studio, um, I am at home. I don't know where the circuit attorney is, but uh, you may hear some extraneous noise that you aren't expecting. We, we expect that that might happen, and it's just a, a consequence of pandemic times. So uh, the circuit attorney, you are now almost uh, four years into your, your first term in office, and I'm wondering what you would say is the biggest success of, of that first, those first years in office. Well, I think the, the, as many uh, successes in my office during my time, but one of the things that we're really addressing and um, implementing is prosecutor-led diversion and focusing our resources on public safety and harm reduction, which is key to healing our communities when we understand that violent crime is plaguing a lot of um, how we interact in the community. Give us an example of uh, what prosecutor-led diversion and how that might be different from uh, other diversion programs people might be familiar with or have heard of. Well, um, as you know, I'm a registered nurse, so I look at crime as a public health crisis. And so when we uh, brought in leading experts around the country to address the root cause of what drives individuals to the criminal justice system. We created the first ever prosecutor-led diversion programs in the state of Missouri, and actually it's only a few around this country. And so we have, we screen 100% of our misdemeanor cases for diversion. We have pre-charge, pre-plea, and post-plea diversion programs. We have young offenders um, diversion program that's for 17 to 25 year olds whose brains are still developing. They're more likely to make rush rash decisions but we're trying to catch them before they cause more serious harm and they're more likely to be um, victims and so we're um, looking at that we're the first prosecutor's office to create the drug opioid education class which we have more opioid just as many opioid deaths as murders in the city of st louis and there's a health disparity access with treatment so we have addiction physicians um, uh, having those classes and we are you know we are this, the difference is it's not the court-run programs, it's the prosecutor-led. So we're involved in many different things that normally prosecutors are, have not been involved in. We're actually the first prosecutor's office in the state of Missouri, as well as around the country, to refuse to prosecute possession of marijuana cases under 100 grams. And there's many different things. And again, what's the distinction between court versus prosecutor-led diversion? And why do you think it's important for it to be a prosecutor-led? led effort as opposed to the courts? Well, we're 
we look at the cases not just from a case coming to our office. We're actually looking at the systemic harms of what fuels the criminal justice system. And that's poverty. That's the broken health care system, educational system, economic system. And when we bring those systems inside our office, one, we hold people accountable, but at the same time, what we're doing, we're actually delivering the services that many of the individuals coming into the criminal justice system lack. So it's also the number one crime driver of mass incarceration is probation and parole. And so we're affecting mass incarceration by saying if it's prosecutor-led and we're holding people accountable, we're stopping the crime continuum of these low-level offenders going further in the system, which causes more harm in the long run. So we're looking at how we as prosecutors can create programs of accountability, but at the same time addressing those systemic issues that take them further down this crime continuum. And what we've done in our short time with these programs, we've had uh, less than 1% recidivism rate, which is key. I want to ask you about uh, your office's policy toward cash bail, because neither Rachel and I are in the courtroom every case, criminal case that your office is involved in. There's been some activists who have claimed that your office still asks for cash bail on certain circumstances. And I wanted you to clarify what the circuit attorney's policy is toward asking judges to uh, administer cash bail or not for certain crimes. Well, first of all, you have to understand, when we talk about ending cash bail, we were the first prosecutor office to address that by bringing the Vera Institute, which is a national leading organization, to study what we do and how we do it. And one of the things many people um, do not understand, we do not control the what type of bond. That's the judges. We make recommendations. And one of the things we've done time and time again, we recommended low-level summonses for felonies, which means it's a it's a, it's a court date and a notification to come to court. But at the same time, we have to understand that we are the ones that reduce um, help holding people in pretrial because they simply cannot pay. We were, we've reduced that pretrial population 40% since we've been doing these tactics. But at the same time, there's still a lot of things that need to happen, but it's not my controlling whether that judge issues a low-level cash bond on certain cases. That's their discretion. We make recommendations of many different um, uh, opportunities for people who cannot afford to pay to get out, but it's ultimately the decision of the judge. So one of the things that many of the advocates need to understand, when you have in cash bail, what you're saying, and a lot of the advocates agree for in this work, you say either it's release or no bond. Well, if those are the only two options, then where do you think most people who will be in our system will be held with no bond? So we have to look at, you know, I support the ending of cash bail, but we also have to understand that it's not just by myself making these recommendations and also the judge has to follow those recommendations. So we are working with the bail bond project and the courts to develop a strategy so we can make sure that we can continue to reduce um, individuals who simply cannot afford to pay a low-level bond simply because they're poor, that that does not happen. And so we are working with VIR. We continue to have our recommendation policy as well as making fair recommendations. But at the same time, we know we are one part of the equation. I wanted to go back to your conversation about diversion. And one of the comments that you make a lot is your focus on diversion and other programs, not putting people immediately into, into the criminal justice system of help keep the city safer. And if you look at the numbers through May, yes, crime is down. Those are the last ones available. But we've also heard of many days recently where multiple people have been shot throughout the city. And I'm wondering how you make the case that the city is safer to those neighborhoods where they are seeing three, four, five, six people shot in a day? Well, first of all, that's a very good question. One of the things we need to start with, you know, as a prosecutor, um, many people want to judge by conviction rates. And we have a 97% conviction rate. But what does that mean when the overall uh, crime rate in the city of St. Louis is three times higher than, than, than the U.S. average? So we also have to look at what perpetuates crime. One of the things with perpetuate crime is poverty. We fail to address poverty, lack of health, health disparities. Uh, third grade class in St. Louis County, in a city of St. Louis, third grade class is different for some young kids. And so we have to address the broken systems that fuel the criminal justice system. And while I talk about diversion, is because if you understand the cycle of victimization, you are victim today, 
uh, perpetrated them all, and people go in and out this continuum. But we fail to address the toxic stress of actually observing a crime taking place because you now you become hyper vigilant. You're carrying a weapon for protection, and you become extreme in your behavior. But we li- let this linger until that person comes across the desk in an arrest warrant in a case across my desk as a file. So we have to look at violence as a long-term approach because we've done the tough on crime rhetoric. And if that equals safe streets, St. Louis City should be the safest city in America. But also we have to understand we gutted our gun laws. So when we talk about these killings and shootings, you know, we have people like the attorney general who want to say they have this tough on crime rhetoric. But at the same time, you may, you decimated our gun laws. You added stand your ground this defense for anybody who commits a crime with a gun. And then you want to talk about why people are being shot. We basically flooded the community with more access to guns in the hands of people who don't need to have a gun in their hands. And so we have to really focus on, you know, the 97%, which takes place outside the court, to address those root causes of why someone is carrying a gun, why someone is hypervigilant, the social determinants of health. And when we do that, that we – we address the hopelessness of why individuals feel like they have to deal with matters in different ways. But this is not sacrificing those violent crime drivers when we hold them accountable. So prosecutors have many tools. And as you know, most of these violent cases are unsolved. So we have to build and look at the trust with the, the, the system. No one talks about that. If you want to, to solve more of these violent crimes, you have to engender trust in the community that, is not trusting of the whole system. Many people think that I'm just talking about police, but it's the police that some police officers dehumanize and have these everyday slights of injustice and how they deal with the community that needs police the most. And then when you get to the prosecutor's office, then individuals are charged more than any other group in, in the in the community that needs it the most. And then when you go to the courts, you're sentenced longer periods of time. So we have to look at how we, as law enforcement, can engender trust. But what we have to understand, we have to attack the root causes and until we do that, it doesn't matter how many police you have on the street. It doesn't matter how many prosecutions you win. It's not going to scratch the surface of violent crime in the city of St. Louis. And we've seen that for decades with zero success. What you're saying makes sense. But when you explain it to these neighborhoods, are you getting buy into these programs or are they telling you we just want the violence to stop and we want it to stop now? Is that message of there is a whole system engendering and a whole problem behind it registering in these neighborhoods if you can't if you don't have people coming forward it doesn't matter what we want to see stop no one's going to come forward to testify being a witness because for fear of retaliation that's why as the circuit attorney and as my experience as a legislator i made sure that we can make sure we give over redacted police reports to protect witness and victims information for fear of retaliation that's why when we talk about policies in terms of what sets me apart from my opponent, we have to address those those things that impede people who want to look for the system to help them. But at the same time, there's many barriers to why someone won't participate in the process, but we fail to talk about that. We only want to talk about a case once we have all the the, the, the magic chips that fall in place, and then we want to give all these services. We have to talk about how our victim services address trauma, regardless of whether you have a case or not, where we're addressing the cycle of victimization by bringing in trauma-informed counseling for sexual assault victims and domestic assault victims. So this is not a, pro- a easy one-size-fits-all solution. This is a complex, multi-layered problem that, as a prosecutor and a minister of justice, you have to correct the ills of building trust in a system that has systemic racism in it, that many people who need the system the most are afraid of it. And we have to recognize that it, it's these decades of flawed policy approaches that has decimated our communities and made all of us less safe. And we have to build trust, but we also have to address and attack these problems in a coordinated fashion, but it doesn't happen over three and a half years. And it's about prevention, not reaction. We can prevent crime if we start with it now instead of waiting until someone is lying in the street. Unfortunately, their life taken at the hands of a police violence as well as any violence. But we have to address it proactively. One big change that's happened during your office, which is not surprising because you took over after an incumbent had been there for a while, is there's been a lot of turnover. Lots of people have left your office, including the person that's running against you, Mary Pat Carl. I want to ask you, how has that affected your office's ability to prosecute and, and what would you say to people that don't particularly like you that that is a black mark 
on your your tenure? The people of the city of St. Louis, when, when they elected me, they elected me to change the system. And when you are talking about comparing my predecessor to me, it's like comparing a whole century to a, to the 21st century, to the, the 17th century to the 21st century. So when you're changing a whole philosophy, you're going to have a lot of prosecutors who, when what comes with change, comes with people who who leave because of that change. But we want to really focus on the good men and women that have stayed in my office because it's about them doing their job every day without fanfare, with with all the criticism, but they're doing their job well and they're doing their job like no other. Um, there's extra scrutiny with my office. You know, many people have, have reported that my office is not prosecuting cases, which is simply not true. We're holding people accountable. We're taking more complex, serious cases to trial. And we are winning those cases, but it's not a win-lose rate. It's actually a save rate, saving individuals from going further in the system, but at the same time holding violent offenders accountable. And we're doing that. But, you know, when people like to hold on to a 16-cent measure of conviction rates, like my opponent, who actually said in a 15-ward um, uh, survey that even she believes conviction rate is not a true determination of how a prosecutor's office is doing, but then you want to judge my office by – less than 4% of our total work, one, um, it's just simply not a good statistic or valid because you can, and even under Jennifer Joyce, we can all agree that violent crime was still high in the city of St. Louis. So what does conviction rate have to, to, to correlate to um, violence in the city of St. Louis? It doesn't. So we have to really understand we are ministers of justice, and that's what a reform on a prosecutor talks about. We're bringing the office back in line with our true mission to pursue justice, not merely convictions, and that's what we have to do, and that's what we're doing. And I want to support the, the hardworking men and women in my office. They're doing a great job. They get no credit, but it's not about who left. It's about who stayed, and I, have, I find disrespect when anyone can continue to ask me about the people who left because if my opponent was so reform-minded, then why did she leave if she's about reform? And we'll be right back after this short break. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. And welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm Rachel Littman, joined by Jason Rosenbaum and St. Louis the Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner. And uh, Ms. Gardner, one of the first recommendations from the Ferguson Commission was using outside prosecutors to investigate instances of officers' use of deadly force or of other police misconduct. And you've chosen instead to create a unit within your office that handles those cases. What was the rationale behind going that route instead of following what the Ferguson Commission had recommended? First of all, um, best practices is you need an independent investigation. Uh, the police cannot investigate themselves. So when you're talking about a special prosecutor, the investigation is still controlled by the people who are under investigation. So what does that do? And then you have to talk about the local prosecutor is accountable to the public. And that accountability goes to making those decisions in terms of holding police accountable. And I believe that since we're elected, we should make those decisions and we should be accountable. That's why when I um, presented and would continue to present legislation to the Board of Aldermen, that we create an independent investigative bureau of individual investigative units that controls the crime scenes and does these investigations in these unique um, high-profile, high-stakes cases. And that's what we need. And um, I will continue to push that because that is best practices. And when there is a conflict, then that's the local prosecutor's decision whether a special prosecutor should come in. But I don't believe that we should shirk our responsibility when we hold anyone accountable, regardless of whether their occupation is police officer. Specifically, the Ferguson Commission suggested the attorney general come in to investigate any time there's police deadly force. Did that recommendation lose a lot of luster after Josh Hawley and Eric Schmidt became attorney general? And as you kind of alluded to, they've had definitely more of a tough on crime mentality than the quote unquote reform prosecutor mentality. Is that partially what might be behind, it might be behind your decision making? No, it's about accountability. And even um, Josh Hawley and the attorney general Schmidt stated that it's the local prosecutor's 
jurisdiction, and they have to make those decisions. So I think that it, we're accountable to um, holding people accountable. The people elect us. And we should be held accountable for whatever decisions, whether the community agrees with it or not, because we are elected by the people in our jurisdictions. And I, so I support accountability. There's been a lot made of tension, quote unquote, between you and the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. This is, this is kind of a two part question. How would you classify your relationship with the officers within the department, the men and women in uniform? And then if there is tension, where does it exist? Well, you know, first of all, I want to clarify the misinformation. I get along with the police chief and the police department, the, the hardworking men and women in the office that do their jobs every day with my office all the time without fanfare or accolades. So we are doing our jobs. We're working, and we're going to naturally have this adversarial tension when we have issues where we don't agree. That's the normal relationship of the prosecutor's office and the police department. But what um, the tension and the source is when you have the St. Louis Police Officer Association led by a business manager, Jeff Florida, and his powerful colleagues that keep him in place, whereas you have an individual who is so divisive that causes harm to the hardworking men and women inside the police department when they put their life on the line by his racist and um, divisive rhetoric. That's where the problem lies. When you have an individual who is so emboldened to say stuff to divide a community that's already hurt and community is suffering from high, intolerable high rates of crime and they need everyone to be a, a part of a message of coming together, well, Jeff Rorta's message of divisiveness and racial um, rhetoric is not called for in a city that wants someone to have cool mind and a a, a, a conversation that brings us all together, regardless of whether we agree on certain issues or not. So he's a the same police officer that will not support an exclusion list to hold bad officers accountable who are not trustworthy or who have the ability to take someone's life and liberty. And if they're under investigation, because he is one of those officers that would write false police reports and to testify um, to take someone's liberty when it was not true. And so he has problems with reforming the criminal justice system and a police accountability, but that's what he is about. He's about this rhetoric of divisiveness, this rhetoric of um, stopping and impeding criminal justice reform. You mentioned that you get along with the individual men and women of the department fairly well. You talk to the chief on a regular basis. Can you look back maybe over the three and a half years where the tension with Mr. Rorta and the inflammatory language that you mentioned has altered the relationship with the men and women of the department or where they maybe have said things to you about the connection with the police officers association? Well, I think that when you have a business manager who continues to spot our lives, you hear it uh, uh, more over and over again, and you use this demonizing caricatures that characterize me as I'm attacking police officers. You know, you, that's, he's basically filling his coffers with money because that's, that's how he raises money for the police union um, fund fees. And so, you know, he has to demonize me because that's his, his I guess, his stick. It's not about reality. It's about fiction. And um, that's what his job is. His job is a one-sided view as a business manager of the St. Louis Police Officer Association. His job is to advocate for individual officers in employer-employee relationships. So I don't have to have a relationship with Jeff Ward or, or the St. Louis Police Officer Association, but what I do have to have is a, a great working relationship with the police chief that controls the hardworking men and women that we do our work with my office every day. And that's what's, what's happening. So I'm not going to be offended if you don't answer this question, because I understand that the Eric Greitens case is under multiple layers of litigation and you can't really answer specific things about the case. But I do want to ask, how, from a political standpoint, do you think the fallout from that particular high profile case is affecting your reelection campaign? Well, I think that, you know, as we see across this country, when you have who you are versus whether you commit a crime is more important in our criminal justice system than hope than a middle-aged um, hairdresser who was victimized by someone who happened to be the governor of the state of Missouri. And I stand up for the middle-aged hairdresser who I believe and everyone else believes um, a crime was committed. And I held 
someone who was the governor of the state of Missouri accountable like I would hold anyone else. So if that's, um, I'm going to take backlash from doing my job. Um, the, like I said, I'm a minister of justice. The only thing that gets the benefit of the doubt is justice. It's not who you are or what your title is or your social economic status or your station in life. It's about justice. So I'm going to do my job. And the people have the opportunity to elect me in August 4th, and hopefully they reelect me. But I'm going to do what's right and what's fair for everyone. Defund the police is a concept that I know has been discussed in uh, law enforcement, prosecutorial, criminal justice reform circles for a while, but it's really started to gain steam after George Floyd's death. Um, what does that phrase mean to you? And do you think prosecutors' offices should be included in perhaps having funds directed away from them and towards education, social services, et cetera? Well, I just want to start the conversation. I really, I really don't agree with these different monikers of defund police, but what they're talking about, and which I do believe is right-sizing the system in terms of, for example, in this jurisdiction, the police department has a 350 million plus budget versus a prosecutor's budget of $8 million. So when you talk about the imbalance, we can all look at it there. So when we talk about right-sizing the system, I believe that to address the root causes of the social systems that have perpetuated crime for decades, we have to bring those services inside our office like I'm doing, bring those job training services inside the office, bring those health care systems inside the office, address the, the wage disparities by giving people the tools to be successful so they won't go through the crime continuum, address the mental health crisis and the, the lack of access to social services. And I believe in bringing those trauma-informed counselors in our office because we are like the emergency room. Everyone comes to us, and then it's all these broken systems, and the only solution they want us to, to give individuals is a long sentence, which is simply not the solution we see that has not been successful. And I'm not saying that, that prison is not reserved for the most dangerous individuals. So we have to really have these conversations that we need to right-size the systems, and I believe we can establish that network, which it has to be delivered differently and at the point of entry in the criminal justice system, as well as work with our community partners and social service networks that are limited in the state of Missouri, as well as the city of St. Louis. So I believe that network needs to be funded, but we also have to be realistic. Let's right-size the system and spread it across the whole criminal justice continuum, not just say let's defund something, because it's a bigger conversation than that. You mentioned that you want to bring a lot of those services, job training, health care, addiction services, et cetera, in-house. Why do you want that to be in your office instead of, as you also then mentioned, partnering with outside agencies that have the expertise in that? Well, um, as you know, I'm a registered nurse, and so I believe in bringing those expertise inside my office. So this is not saying that somehow we're having prosecutors deliver social services, but we have a unique kind of intersection here. We can't wait 30 days for a bed. We can't wait six months for a person to get into treatment because there's a public safety harm reduction model that has to be deployed if we're really about public safety. We can't wait. And many, if you really understand the landscape of social services, it's a waiting list for most of these, these, these groups. And when you have an influx of cases, that's a lot to handle, and they're uniquely um, situated. And so we have to have unique experience, not just in social service, but with the intersection of the criminal justice system as well as social service network. And that's what is best practices. And that's why I brought um, WashU, uh, Brown School of Medicine, Brown School, uh, WashU School of Medicine, as well as Florida State inside my office. And that is best practices. And that's what we want to do. What's your view of the push to close the, the what's known as the workhouse, which seems to have gained a lot more momentum in the Board of Aldermen? Like I said, I, I believe that whatever the people of the city of St. Louis decide, I support that. But what I tell people, I'm not the facility manager of the workhouse, and I believe that question is best answered for the, the mayor and the public safety director who control that part of the system. But what I can control is individuals being held pre-trial, um, and I've reduced that population 40%. And so I control the whole system and will continue to do those things to keep the workhouse uh, uh, population down. So whatever the community decides or the Board of Aldermen, then you know I'm making it where you probably won't need the workhouse and you can redirect those resources to right-size the systems that we're talking about. How do you think that 
Floyd's death, George Floyd's death on Memorial Day has changed the contours of this race um, in terms of the conversations that are being had or in terms of how people maybe are viewing your positions and your opponent's positions differently? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things I think that um, unfortunately it took eight minutes and 46 seconds to um, show the world of how careless Mr. George Floyd's life was taken at the hands of people who were to protect and serve and at the cries of community begging the police officers to help and no one was able to help or stop this unfortunate death that was displayed across national news but for the um, cameras that we all have now and technology. And I think that it, it woke a lot of people up when we have these conversations that when you're talking about reforming the system that has been broken, that needs to be dismantled and rebuilt so it can truly be about public safety. You have people who we've kind of had these conversations that because you're talking about reform, you're somehow anti-police. Some, because you're talking about police accountability, you're sometimes for, you know, anti you know, public safety. And I think that now we are at the total moment in time that we have to really look at the systemic racism of the American system that we all know exists. And we now can identify and understand that police are not immune from racism and we have to address systemic racism in the whole criminal justice system. And I think that we have to also look at the racial component that in the state of Missouri, over 91% of African Americans have stopped more than any other group. We have to look at um, how one in three African American men will have some interaction with the criminal justice system in their life. We have to look at the school to prison pipeline that fuels the criminal justice system. We have to look at the in state, city of St. Louis, um, particularly in the state of Missouri. You talk about the Ferguson Report for the sake of all the, the disinvestment, the healthcare disparities that even technology cannot address the health disparity that we see that's been highlighted and perpetuated by COVID-19. So we see these intersections of systemic racism, and now people are waking up from that are not just African Americans or people of color and saying enough is enough. And I think that many people are starting to see that, you know, reform-minded prosecutors have been on the right side of history. We have been having these conversations about police accountability and um, attacking root causes of crime but not sacrificing public safety. So right now people are starting to say, hey, maybe that it's something to this. Maybe not. we're not so crazy. Maybe this is the way to go. And I think that this is a, a unique time, a unique opportunity to push further and to push harder and to really address how we come together as the Missourians and the St. Louis Cityans that I know we love each other, we can do better. So we have to heal the trauma that certain groups have been um, – going through and inflicted that even veterans in the military have not gone through some of this PTSD. And we have to address that. If we want to heal our communities and, and, and come together and actually address long-term effects of making sure we're all safe. That's St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner. You can find all of our episodes of Politically Speaking on our website, stlpublicradio.org. I'm on Twitter at R. Lipman, two P's, two N's. Jason, where can people find you? Jay Rosenbaum. And Circuit Attorney Gardner, where can people reach out to you or the office or the campaign on uh, social media or the World Wide Web? Well, you can reach out to my campaign at votekimgardner.com. VoteKimGardner.com. Until next time, so long.